So our Bible teaching passage for this, our final chapel of this chamber fest time is Matthew chapter 16. If you want to turn to that, Matthew 16 verses 13 to 18, the incredible earth shattering confession of Peter as to who Jesus is. Matthew 16 verses 13 to 18. Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. <coughs> Throughout my lifetime, I have only personally known or met, met and gotten to know one other individual by the name of Wesley. There are other Wesleys, but Wesley isn't that common, unless you come from a Wesleyan heritage, like John Wesley or Charles Wesley, which actually I do. My parents named me after either, take your pick, they said. <laughs> They're both good, you know. Um, but I only knew personally one other fellow named Wesley, and it was while I was in boarding school in Congo, Africa. Uh, my second year, I got to know, well, I admired, I looked up to another Wesley, and his name was Wesley Wayne, and I was Wesley <coughs> White. And I was so happy to be confused as to identity with this guy, Wesley Wayne, because he was older, he was very fit, he was a cross-country runner, and he looked really good, even his face was stunningly kind of handsome. And most important of all, all of the girls adored him. <laughs> and... So I was happy when there was identity confusion. But of course, problematic identity issues can sometimes be a lot much more serious than that. Once again, as we've been emphasizing this week, how learning in the context of Bible issues for Muslim background peoples and how it raises the specter of the most important distinctives and essential doctrines of our own Christian faith and commitments, then this is another one that certainly cries out, I would suggest to you, for our attention in what can only be described as eternity determining. And that is the Bible's insistence upon who Jesus is. What is his identity? Jesus Christ is none other than the Son of God. This has to do with the very serious identity issue raised by Jesus himself when he asks the question of his disciples, who do people say that I am? <coughs> the identity of Jesus is a huge difference when we compare Christianity and Islam. The text in Matthew 16, first of all, is concerned quite clearly with common perceptions of Christ. As we read in the question posed by Jesus in verse 13, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is how Jesus very often referred to himself, and the term for people, hoi anthropoi, simply means humanity, people in general. Jesus is asking about common perceptions concerning his identity. And here in Matthew, it is dealing with Jewish background people, so that the disciples respond with suggestions that would be familiar, like John the Baptist, or Elijah, Jeremiah, or other prophets from Hebrew history and understanding. Today, in the West, 
places like North America and Europe where I work, the vast majority of people would identify Jesus as simply some sort of extravagant philanthropist, doing good and bringing blessing, a good old guy. Or at best, a wonderfully gifted teacher, even though they would be ignorant of what Jesus actually taught that would certainly offend them like his warnings about riches and wealth, or strict morality, or the call to actually love your enemies, or the ugliness of sin, or the reality of hell. I'm always amused when people say, oh yeah, Jesus is a great teacher, and you say, Do you, have you read what he taught? It would offend them, <laughs> as well as bless. In Islam, Jesus is honored as a prophet, but only a prophet. The Quranic teaching, he is not even on a par with the honor bestowed upon Muhammad as the last and greatest prophet of God. That is, according to the hadith, the commentaries of Islamic scholars writing about what the Quran says. However, isn't it interesting throughout the Gospels that in the supernatural world, even the evil forces, the very demons from hell, know and express the real truth. What some scholars interestingly refer to as the diabolical truth. So that we read, in, for example, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 11, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the Son of God. The demons know who he is. Or as we read in Mark chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, the demon-possessed man ran up to Jesus and bowed down before him, shouting in a loud voice, he said, What business do you have with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? So that we understand in the supernatural world the real identity of Jesus Christ is perfectly clear. <coughs> he is none other than what Peter ends up confessing, the Son of God. However, then we come to the critical moment in this passage when Jesus poses the same question <coughs> directly to the disciples themselves. And of course, it is posed to all of us as well as we read this time and time again for centuries later. Verse 15, but who do you, yourselves, say that I am? Literally, it reads, but you, you, yourselves. Who do you say that I am? Some Bible scholars believe that there is intended here in Hebraic tradition what they call a heavenly pause. As all of heaven waits with bated breath, wondering Will anyone in all of humanity get it? The very identity of Jesus is so crucial, but will anyone confess him as he ought to be confessed? <clears throat> and dear Peter, our beloved Peter the disciple, comes through for us, for all of us. And by the way, the early church tradition suggests that Oral history credibly claims that his response was loud and bold and blatant. It suggests that he shouted it out. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was one of his most confident, bold, blatant statements ever. It was not quiet and demure, it was sure and bold and confident. You are the Christ. He gets it as we're all supposed to get it. And so Peter affirms that Jesus is Christos, 
the anointed one, the sent one, the Messiah himself. He gets it, as we're all supposed to get it, and so Peter affirms that he is the Son of God himself. And he gets it like we're all supposed to get it, and so Peter affirms that Jesus is in fact the Son of the living God. That little addition that Matthew does not want us to skirt over in the slightest, reminding us that this Jesus is, yes, the Son of God, but more particularly, the Son of the living God, is absolutely critical. Because it affirms that Jesus Christ brings us the flesh and blood presence, incarnational presence, not of a historical distant deity, not God as he used to be, but is no more. Not God who is so inactive, so uninvolved, so out of touch that he is good as dead. But the living God, alive and well and demonstrating in himself, in his own person, who the Son is in the power of his Spirit, the Trinitarian understanding of Jesus. This is what Peter gets so well, and the Bible here hopes that you and me will get and understand so well as well. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The identity of Jesus Christ in your understanding and your life practice and in where he stands in your life is critical. Who is Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Do you listen to the interpretation of the West? He's this wonderful, extravagant philanthropist, great teacher, whom nobody actually studies what he said. Or of Islam, he's a great prophet, but underneath Muhammad, the final greatest prophet at all, is, is that how you understand Jesus? Now the passage moves on with the wonderful words in verse 17, and Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus, don't ever skip over such important words as that, wherever they come up in your Bible, and Jesus, then Jesus, is always prelude, always prelude to surprises, to intrigue, to authoritative teaching, to demonstrations of wonder and grace and power. The words, and Jesus, then Jesus, they are what we should understand as loaded words. But they now convey to us the response of Jesus Christ to such an potent confession as Peter has given. Jesus singularly here refers to Peter, the only time in all the Gospels. When something happens only once, you give it very detailed attention. He here refers to Simon Peter, Simon Bar Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. Bar is the Hebrew word for son. Bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. Did you know that Peter's lineage goes all the way back to the prophet Jonah? Why does he name him as such? Reminding him maybe of his lineage to the prophet Jonah as if to say, do not be like Jonah of your heritage who resisted preaching the truth to the Ninevites, but preach this truth of who Jesus really is to all the nations. It is critical, in other words, that the whole wide world hears about the truth of the identity of Jesus. This is why I feel so incredibly privileged to bring this to people like Muslim background folk. The Ninevites, or the Iranians, or the Scottish, or the 
Ukrainians, the Russians need to know. And even you this morning, who've maybe heard of Jesus many, many times, but today you need to think again, who is Jesus Christ in my life? Jesus also makes clear that if there is any chance that Peter or you or me will get it about this Jesus Christ, this is not because we are holy, it's not because we are smart, it's not because we are better than anyone else, but it depends, he says, on a supernatural revelation from heaven. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> Some of you, right now, this day, this final Friday of Chamber Fest time, are wondering as to the standing of Jesus in your life. You may come from a background where that's been told to you many, many times, but there are some of you right now, today, who are really wondering, where does Jesus actually stand? Do I know him? Who is he? And you need a supernatural revelation. I can't convince you, your counselor, your teachers, your pastors, your professors at university can't convince you. It has to come from heaven. I pray right now, God, for some one or two individuals right here this morning who are needing your revelation of who Jesus is. I pray you give that to them today. In the name of Jesus. This is why you see, though, Jesus here particularly calls God my Father. Because any good father delights in revealing the most important things to all their children. He doesn't play favorites. It's for all. Of course he wants to reveal that to you. And as we pray for that, that can happen. In the Muslim background people I deal with, it's just story after story of these dreams in which Jesus is revealed. And I got jealous of that and said, I'm praying for that for all these people. I haven't had a dream. <laughs> so I went home and prayed and Cindy and I got down and the I our bed before we went to bed, and I said, I want a dream. Don't leave me up. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you the end of the story. You're going to have to come ask me. I did have a dream, but it was surprising. Jesus' response also relates to all of this to the church itself, doesn't he? In what N.T. Wright calls, I love this statement, he calls it, this is the rock-solid truth that is the entire basis of the church. We read in verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus means that the truth of who he is is the rock, the very foundation of what the church is about. And of course, the church, meaning the global church, has many attributes. It is full of love. It demonstrates mercy. It is a family. It supports people in many ways. It cares for the voiceless and the forgotten. But let us never forget that at the foundational level, like rock solid, the church is about the truth that we confess. Who this Jesus is. What is his identity? This is what changes lives. It changes the world. The clearly understood and clearly recognized real identity of Jesus. I can do all sorts of wonderful helps for these Muslim background people. And I do. I do my best. I go to court with them. I write letters to lawyers for them. I seek jobs for them. But the thing that changes their life is when I tell them the truth of who Jesus is. And their life is transformed by him, not just help. 
Jesus puts it here so clearly, upon this rock I will build my church. And finally, lastly today, Jesus' response suggests not only what we could call the rock-solid truth, but we could call it the offensive truth. He says it at the end of verse 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. It is clearly a picture of the church on the offensive, so that the possibility that the gates of Hades might overpower it is precisely because the church and its teaching, its alternative, its life-giving nature is actually challenging the very gates of Hades. But why does Jesus refer to it as the gates of Hades? The gates in the Bible, all throughout, especially its Hebrew background, have to do with culture and cultures. All of the culture was dependent upon what happened at the gates. Justice, court, arts, teaching, philosophy happened at the gates. The gates in the Bible have to do with the culture, so that Jesus is referring to the very culture of Hades, that is a culture influenced by death and destruction, culture defined by evil and injustice, culture given over to Satan's plans and purposes, culture full of brokenness and hatred, <coughs> disharmony, and all that mitigates against the shalom beauties that God intends for his world culture that is under the very influence, the porch of hell that is referred to as Hades. Jesus' response shows us that the church bearing the truth of who Jesus really is is <laughs> on the offensive. Not being offensive, but on the offensive, rather than defensive in posture, hiding ourselves, protecting ourselves from the bad, evil world around us. No, that's not Jesus' picture at all. He intends a church on the offensive, countering a culture of death with the life that is in Christ, countering a culture of injustice with the righteousness that is in Christ, countering a culture that is under the very influence of the porch <coughs> of hell with all that bespeaks the incredible wonders and beauty of God's new creation that we call heaven. I'm so happy to be part of Jesus' purpose to build the church. <coughs> but for all of this, first of all, dear young students, where I've sat in that place, Chehi, many years, before I moved on to counselor and teacher and chaplain and all sorts of jobs. It starts where you are. As Jesus' confrontational question does not let us escape, but its intrusiveness and bluntness is directly speaking to you right now. But you, yourselves, who do you say that I am? But you means you and me. Even this moment, this existential time right here on Friday morning at the conclusion of Chamber Fest. You see, the identity issue is not the therapeutic, self-focused self-centered focus on your identity as the ultimately important. Don't believe the thought that it's all about discovering yourself. Self-identity. But what actually matters most is your identification of the identity of Jesus changes everything. And it will 
lead you to your identity. So some of you, this is an invitation now to explore discovering who this Jesus really is with your counselor, with a teacher, coach, with me, with Mr. Bergen, our director, in these last two days to take time, I need to know where does Jesus actually stand in my life? Who is he? Not for the world generally, but for me. And for others, right now, this moment, this is the time for your ardent confession. Joining me right now in declaring in the same pattern of the oral tradition of the early church that Peter shouted this out. This was not demeaned. It was quiet and soft and unconfident. It was his great declaration. And so I invite you to say it with me if you're ready. If you're not, you just be quiet. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Join me if you'd like, and we're going to say it three times in succession, each time louder than the other. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. that's true for you, your whole life, your music, your college, your plans, your future will be shaped around the identity of Jesus. Who do you yourselves say that I am? The Christ you confess is the Christ who died for you. Son of the living God who went to death for you. <laughs>